lectures, workshops and seminars across India, Thailand, the United States, the United Kingdom, Ireland, Germany, Australia, Canada and the UAE. We are truly honoured to have you here with us today ma'am. I request you to kindly deliver the keynote address. On the dais, the ever youthful and uh, leadership icon in our profession, Mr. Lamit Paseen, uh, and the architect of this function, along with our friend, Director Santa Kumar, the chief of Manupatra, Mr. Deepak Kapoor, and the co leader there, Ms. Priyanka, and all my esteemed senior and younger faculty who have assembled here, and maybe some students and rapporteurs researchers. A uh, very warm uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, at the outset, I really commend this effort. Uh, I believe what uh, Symbiosis founder and uh, an engineering, Dr. S. Bhim Zundar sir always says that uh, when great things have to happen, a lot of things happen as coincidence. I was discussing with Dr. Shantakumar way back uh, three years ago that we need to have a forum for law teachers in a very different way. We have many, we earlier had university based associations of teachers and law teachers as part of that or we have had some all India law teachers congress kind of body which is good in some ways but did not make much of a headway. And then uh, we had, we both are associated with the International Association of Law Schools and uh, we never thought that he would leave us so soon. Our mentor, late Dr. Madhav Menon, at that time said that somebody from Gujarat, somebody from Goa, somebody from South, somebody from North, as the leader of the law school, should come together and create a forum. I don't know if this is the way the coincidence is happening, but I must also tell you that it was advocate Dalit Basi who took the initiative along with Dr. Menon to honor great law teachers. Sir, it's, it's another pleasant coincidence. <coughs> Who are here because he shares so many memories of his humility, his leadership, and his capacity, innate capacity to collaborate with diverse groups. I think that is the hallmark of a great leader and trendsetter. And here we have one more trendsetter, which is uh, uh, Mr. Kapoor. Because when I returned from Europe, uh, the way the law teachers were adept at technology, students were adept at technology, and I used to really struggle to get my data for my research. So when I came back to India, already Manupatra was there. This, uh, by about 2002, I re-entered the law teaching and I felt that this was a thing that India needed. But then, you know, as it was rightly pointed out by uh, Director Shantakumar sir, uh, whether technology is a democratizing force, a facilitating force, or is it, or is it an Tool is a question because of the affordability question of technology, access to technology issues. We know as lawyers and as human rights people, we have many paradigms which come in here. All that aside, this innovation of Manupatra has not stopped, it has gone ahead. Therefore, it is another very significant coincidence that they are here talking about the future of the development. Now, I have been asked in the keynote address to address this idea of future of legal pedagogy in the future changing terrain of legal education. That presupposes an investigation or a search into another fundamental question. Where is legal profession going? Dr. Menon, in the fag end of his life, uh, by about 2019, all of us were by 2018, all of us were committed in either action after that. One is he exited at a time when Corona was just peeping its ugly head. And then uh, we could not have this kind of a conflict for almost two and a half years. Our deliberations were through the technological means. But you know, at that deliberation he talked about practice ready lawyers. Uh, so some of us came together in kids law school in Orissa. And we, uh, under the leadership of uh, his <coughs> own uh, Villa Foundation, we developed certain ideas. And he had done thorough research on developing skill courses for lawyers. And uh, they were divided into transaction lawyering, uh, developing development lawyering, his passion for NGO and uh, people's work. And it 
was also looking at civil law practice, appellate law practice, appellate court practice, among other things. And I was so taken with that idea that that was something that I thought was missing in the legal education in India. Uh, we do do that. Students on their own, they go and they do. So the future of legal education for me is readying our current aspirants and our current lawyers as well to face that reality which is going to come to in future in making them future ready lawyers. Right? Dr. Menon said, if it is practice ready lawyers, I transformed it in symbiosis. I took him very seriously. I don't know how many other law school leaders who were there who took it, but I created a curriculum, rolled out a curriculum of 15 courses. And fundamental courses of civil law practice, criminal law practice were there, but optional courses of development and uh, transaction law came in. So, when I did my own deliberation with our group of stakeholders, which was our alumna, advisors like uh, uh, Mr. Basin's uh, colleagues in uh, different layers of lawyers, and then uh, law teachers, the management, the community, the government representatives, we realized that this thought process was already there in some parts of the world, particularly in Harvard. Dean Martha, you know, went ahead, when she took over as the dean, she went and met her global alumna, her alumna who were placed in different positions in corporates. And she got in a metric of what was required in those jobs. And based on that, she rolled out the curriculum. That is future ready. No future can be built unless you have the foundation of the past, unless you learn from the limitations and errors of the past, and hybridize it with the new needs which are emerging. For us in India and in the world, the new normal was pushed to us. What was that new normal? Online teaching. Because we could not meet each other, we could not keep our young students in that young age group into, we couldn't push them into the dungeon of depression and loneliness. So some of us who were already future ready in terms of technology, we were able to harness the potential of the technology. Within four days, my teachers were teaching with all the uh, modern uh, technology-centric pedagogy to the students. And we were slow, students were faster than us. Because that generation, the millennial generation, and now Gen Zard, we say, Generation Zard, they have that self-driven, self-learning, technocentric, and future readiness kind of instinct in them. Because they were born and they were growing up in this electronic age. Whereas we who are teaching them are not that fast in picking up the technology. So, uh, going back to that, when the new normal came, in the form of pandemic struck legal education, uh, uh, we held a conclave, online conclave, under the leadership of again a law from Sunana and Sunana. And uh, we realized that many of us were talking a language which was far apart from what was actually needed and what was the anguish of that young age. Therefore, my submission here is the future terrain of legal education is going to be what the stakeholders, as Sir rightly said, what the stakeholders' future is going to be. What is that future? And are we, as legal pedagogic personnel, ready for that future in readying our students? The answer is no. Why do I say this? You look at the situation of legal profession across the world. I tell you, as of today, we are standing on the threshold of two important areas. One is opening up of Indian borders for foreign legal professionals, which means that they can't plead in the court of law, but we have to bring a barrage of new needs because major big players of the world have their headquarters in those countries. Therefore, all the businesses are driven by their decisions. And these decisions are informed by the sense of law, informed by the sense of justice. Are our students having those global competencies? to become the team members of these or collaborators of these? Answer is not really. I have not come, I have done my own survey and that's why Simbas Law School, Pune has always had a cutting edge advantage because I always address where the gap was. One of the major gap that we found long ago when I came back from abroad was global competencies in our students. Students have the capacity, but we don't have the wherewithal to give that global competence. So we got lawyers who were dealing with foreign matters. We got lawyers who were recognized abroad, whose law firms were extending their operations abroad. People like uh, uh, Advocate Lalit Basin, who were leading these organizations, who were open.
open the collaboration with the training the youngsters. So this is how we went forward. Now in this whole process, the key driver is technology, legal technology. So I, I have done a lot of research in this area to find one major point that when we developed a computer lab, my vice chancellor then, who was from the old school, I was also from the old school, but I could renew myself. So he said that there is a lab because Bar Council says there could be a lab. Now I said, how do we synergize into teaching? So getting a proper course on legal technology was only possible because of Mahatma. I must congratulate you and I should ever be indebted to you because you were one of the front runners. And that we also had uh, EBC and others. But our idea of lab was teaching them how to use the database. Till then we were doing it manually. As a student, I did it manually. So this was our first step. And then farther than that, Manupatra move, BBC move, especially in terms of aggregating these case notes, as such a case notes. But I want to put before you the next challenge that's going to come. What American Bar Association in 2000 pointed out, e-lawyering project. You know, when it came to e-lawyering idea, it found out that many law schools do not have a systematic way of teaching technology to the students, predicting legal technology movement, and also the lawyers lack those skills, the CLEs, the continuing legal education structures did not look at hands-on training for the lawyers. So from there, Stanford and others came on board, and then what happened was a miracle. But it took many years. Right now, last uh, almost, uh, I think from 2019, there is a very serious approach in Stanford and others. Therefore, we saw LexisNexis is coming out with, a, with, a, with an engine called uh, Lex Machina. And then we have Bloomberg. We have now, when, when uh, researchers were writing about it, they said that the only one operator who came somewhat close to that was Manupatra in the developing world. Now, what is it? Lex Machina and Bloomberg both operate on the basis of the big data approach. There are these technological developments which the law has to open up because if you look at India's revolution in terms of big players, creating big corporations, outsourcing big businesses to India, offshoring, it was because of the technology. Technology was the disruptive force and law will be no exception to that. When we are opening our gates to global players, law is going to be uh, future readiness of our law students, legal professionals and law teachers is going to be challenged by this disruptive force of the technology. Therefore, our future readiness is going to be all stakeholders here on this dais and off the dais is about understanding this technological movement in the future terrain of law school. Therefore, all law schools when we surveyed, we came to know that Except the new experiment in National Forensic University, which is looking at data science as one of the courses. And in Bangalore, one law school which pushed Python courses and students had to attend in their computer, it's a private law school, in their computer science department this course. Even I myself have restricted and I'm asking my teachers that we have to bring it to this kind of a fruition of bringing other ideas. I came to know that in India we are at the 20% level of what the legal tech study should be. Now, what is that legal tech study and how do we use this democratization approach through the technology in legal education is the question. Democratization in the legal profession, democratization and relieving of the burden of our courts of the past backlog because the amount of the population, the amount of the litigation and the number of judges and the number of personnel in the courts, in all these, it is a technology which can be answered, but then there are other fear also. As Antonio Gramsci long ago said, that when there is a crisis, there is also reconstruction. When he was writing in the context of Mussolini, Italy. He was a young law student who was imprisoned and he died mysteriously of some disease. But Antonio Gramsci's prison book is a classic as far as jurisprudence is concerned. So Gramsci was the one who said that crisis gives a reconstructive approach. So the new normal, which we got used to during the pandemic, which many of the law schools, as the director Santakumar rightly pointed out, did not have the privilege of, where the law students had to wait for their law degree completion for one and a half years. By that time, my students were already having one year service. So, because Bar Council was very accommodative of these diversities, I must give it to Bar Council. But the reality is of techno evolution or legal tech evolution in the legal education institution. 
So where is the solution for such a thing? One is affordability of the technology. Second is aligning our curriculum to the developments which are happening. For example, we have a predictive analysis sector, which means that we are going to make our lawyers more accountable as well, that they will not give false promises to the litigants unless they have a map of what predictive analysis of big data in past cases with similar facts shows. So it is going to be pre-litigation predictive analysis, it's going to be judicial analytics in which Manu Patra has made some strides, but there are bigger strides which could be made with this base that they have. And then we have security, for example, private data privacy and security. How lawyers will protect this data privacy and security, among other things. Because I have been given only 10 minutes, I can't go deep into that. If you look at us as law, insti law teaching institutions or legal education institutions and law teachers, in this hall, if I ask a question, how many of you have taught big data or uh, coding as part of the curriculum in your law schools? Not you, but your law schools. I'm sure nobody will put the hand up except our friend from NMS. <laughs> because that is also a very new syllabus, yeah. just uh, two years uh, old. That means now is the time for us to visit our legal technology curriculum. And uh, 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 accept that it's only catering to skills in the basic way, uh, as a tool, technology as a tool and not technology as a curriculum. So we have to move from technology as a tool to technology as a curriculum. Uh, that curriculum could be looking at court management uh, technology, it could be looking at case management technology in the law firm, it could be looking at evidence-based technological interface as a curriculum and getting students knowledge, skill and the values, the value of access to technology, democratizing the technology, not to use the technological power for exploitation and exclusion because quality education stands on three pillars in law. One is the knowledge, second is the value, and third is the skill. Therefore, moving further, we will have to, from the present, think about how the future terrain of our stakeholders and our profession will change, and at the same time, how would we unleash the power of us as the teachers, and us not as the teacher in the didactic way, in the lecture methodology, but the teachers also as facilitators of learning. That's where we are moving to. Therefore, here, uh, today's uh, discussion will definitely bring it to the fore, I would say. We will have to think of democratizing our classrooms, because for me, and for all of us lawyers, freedom and democracy are the cardinal virtues and values. And in legal education, if we do not practice that alongside the ethics, I don't think we can expect it in our uh, student community and later in the profession. If you are saying that profession lacks that quality, it is because we we have not invested much in legal education. Sir. We might have invested in 28 plus national law schools or national law universities. I, I, I have my own uh, viewpoint about that. I started my career uh, after five years in a small town in Bangalore National Law School, which then was just emerging. Dr. Menon invited me to join the team as the first woman to get a tenured law teacher position at that time. But then what I saw later on was that there are also good experiments happening in private sector uh, who are prepared to invest because they charge the consumer for that. It's a very pure kind of not-for-profit based business. But if you look at the state university affiliated law school situation is very different. And vernacular medium dominance in the law school. But for all of that technology has answered. So the last challenge that I would like to share with you is chat GPT. Uh, November 2022, this platform has come, which is based on the LLM method, learning method. And then what happened? You have fear that students are able to aggregate the knowledge and then reproduce it without putting much effort. What is the problem? Now you go ahead of them. Instead of rejecting it and instead of calling it as a shortcut method, etc., you integrate it and you check the plagiarism on that also because that GPT can replace data. It cannot replace thinking. It cannot replace value. It cannot disconnect the heart from the head. So uh, this is where teachers will have to be ready for these new challenges. You cannot be ready unless you are faster than your students or as good as your students in understanding the technology. Don't reject the technology before understanding its potential because 
Even professionals got advantages because of chat GPT. No amount of chat GPT can replace a learning processor kind of experience because human nature, predictive approach to the uh, uh, to the issue, etc., are very much driven by experience and the resources that an individual has over a period of time, for which machine will definitely take another 20 years. Therefore, in the light of this, I would like to say that it is time for us to review our curricula and it is time for us to look seriously at legal technology and then also to learn from each other's best practices. It's only at and it's a fortune of all of us that today all these points have been taken up in various uh, discussions and interviews and also in the form of sharing of best practices and as we go ahead in the day in our deliberations definitely uh, all of these ideas would come I hope because we have such experts. Uh, so there is a uh, discussion there on corporate readiness. My submission would be profession readiness because corporate is not the only avenue where our products are going to go. They are going to serve the country as well. Basically our profession is jurisdiction bound and our education is also concentrating on law which is jurisdiction bound. But then a little bit of comparative, a little bit of global avenue also needs to be brought in as we are opening up the borders for the profession. So it is in this light that the future terrain driven by these changes, which is uh, going to be very important, needs to be driven by our mindset change as law teachers and legal education providers and our openness to learn the technology and impart the technology to be playing a democratic role and not to be excluded, not to be rejected and at the same time not to be falling into the trap of worshipping or defying that. I hope with that rationality we will proceed during the day and I express my immense gratefulness to GNLU leadership of Dr. Shantakumar and the Manu Padra leadership team and uh, all the wisdom of uh, Advocate Basim and uh, Justice Shah which definitely will be a great learning for all of us and I wish all the best 